is Keys to the Shop, episode 424, Developing Guides for Your Menu in Hospitality. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I am your host for the show, and I'm so glad to have you here today. Go ahead and take a moment and subscribe to Keys to the Shop, and that way you'll always stay updated when new episodes come out, as well as helping the show out, because the more you subscribe to the show, the better it shows up for people when they are searching for things like coffee shop insights and tools and interviews that we do here at Keys to the Shop. So thank you so much for doing that. And also don't forget to share these episodes. Whenever you hear something that really resonates with you, it's really easy to uh, click a few buttons and put out on social media that you're listening to Keys to the Shop and you recommend this episode to other people in your network. Now, I wanna make you aware of an upcoming offering from Keys to the Shop Consulting. That's right, Keys to the Shop not only does a podcast, but also Keys to the Shop is a consulting company working with entrepreneurs and experienced business owners to help them build an amazing and thriving coffee bar. One that is not only profitable, but is joy filled and fulfilling and excellent. And so that's been really awesome to do one on one coaching and site visits and training and all sorts of fun stuff. But also, I want to make room for more opportunities for owners to get the benefits of conversation and collaboration. And that's why I'm introducing key holder coaching groups launching in September. This inaugural group is going to be five members strong. The group will be made up of five coffee shop owners who are all dedicated to improving their leadership, their business, and helping each other do the same through encouragement, through insights and sharing, and also through accountability. And we all get better together. And I've personally been a part of a couple of different mastermind groups over the years and found them so beneficial. And I'm excited to launch these. So check the link in the show notes for key holder coaching groups to learn more and apply today. And if you want more information or you want to have a conversation about that one-on-one with me, just send me an DM on Instagram at keys to the shop or email me chris at keys to the shop.com. Love the response so far for these groups, that inaugural group launching in September. If there's enough interest here, it will be also something that multiplies. So there could be a few groups and that would be awesome as well. So if you're interested in that, again, email me chris at keys to the shop.com or check the link in the show notes for keyholder coaching groups and also keys to the shop.com slash consulting. Well, delivering on our promises is what makes us stand out as specialty coffee operators. That means that we look for just methods and practices, habits, and tools to help us fulfill those promises. We promise tasty coffee and we want to deliver it every time. And that's why the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer is such an amazing piece of equipment using SCA award-winning technology to help you extract an amazing range of possibilities from your coffee. It's next level batch brewing, but it's not just an amazing batch brewer. It makes tea, batch dice lattes, batch cold brew, it is just a wonder. And you can go check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee and just see the testimonials and the people that are using this machine to take their coffee to the next level. If you're looking to increase the efficiency of your bar, the quality of your coffee, look great doing it and increase lines of profitability, then I would recommend looking into the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer. Again, check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee. Plant-based beverages are absolutely outpacing regular milk in coffee bars. It is one of those things that the customer has spoken and we have responded. And there are a lot of options that you can go with, but the first mover and the first in choice for baristas is definitely the barista series from Pacific. The barista series is a line of plant-based performance beverages created for and approved by 
baristas, and it stands up to the heat from steaming, produces great texture for latte art, and keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee. I would recommend going to pacificfoodservice.com to find out more about this awesome beverage and what it can do in your coffee bar. Get samples and try it for yourself. I think you'll really be impressed. Again, check them out at pacificfoodservice.com. And if you're looking for the best plant-based beverages to serve your customers, it's got to be the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, today I'm going to be talking to you about two areas that I think are just the bedrock of great coffee bars, and that is your menu and hospitality that you offer while you are creating the menu. And what I want to talk about today is not necessarily to talk to you about the idealized version of what you have in mind for your menu and for your hospitality, because I think we all kind of have in our heads this idea of what we want it to be. We're inspired by restaurants and bars and coffee bars and other concepts out there that all kind of get accumulated into our head and we dream this up and we even say it so much in our vision statements and mission statements. But what we don't often do is create an environment that is resourcing people to actually execute those things. And you can hire the absolute right people for the job, the best attitudes and the best experience or whatever metric you want to use for judging how you find the right people for your unique expression of coffee in this particular time and place. But If you don't give them the tools to do their job, so we've said here before, then you're going to limit them. You're going to throttle their effectiveness, and that is going to create resistance. People are going to have resistance to coming to your coffee bar. Whether they can articulate that or not doesn't matter. The fact is, is that accumulated resistance in a lot of small ways in areas in the cafe make it easier for people to choose other options. People would rather invest a lot of money in a home barista setup sometimes than risk going to a coffee bar that just doesn't have their stuff together. If it was like you delivered an excellent experience every single time, my guess, of course, this is not scientific at all, but my guess is that people wouldn't be as tempted because you do such a great job as well. So maybe at the very most here, you would have somebody with a home barista set up who still came to your coffee bar because of your great hospitality and the consistency of your execution across different shifts, even different cafes. And all of that, like I said, just not it doesn't happen accidentally. It happens because you have a plan for execution. You've given people tools, and that means you've thought things through. That's where guides come in. A guide is more than simply a directive. It is a how-to. It is in very great detail specifications given to how things should go. And the most important things in your cafe are hospitality and your menu. I mean, we are in business to sell people a product that we make. And the manner in which we serve people and make things and interact with each other is definitely the other thing that's the most important. And without those two things, you're just going to be plugging holes on a sinking ship uh, by chasing, by, by putting out fires here and there and just wondering what's happening. One of the best tools that you can have is a guide for those two areas. And so today, assemble both of those things. And my clients will recognize some of what I'm talking about here because I walk through this process with them to create hospitality or drink guides for their particular menu and cafe. It's very important. That's why I do it with all of my clients. And I want to share with you a little bit about what goes into those things. And so let's start first with the menu, okay? So when you're talking about the menu, it's easy for us to set people up for success if we are training them on the right things. Unfortunately, and I'm just like a lot of people, we tend to train them on the most esoteric 
of things. The conceptual, the theoretical, the wide world of coffee, the history, the the culture, and all of that stuff. As if to say, if we take people's breath away by showing them the enormity of coffee and the complexity of coffee, and we get them juiced up and inspired, that that will make up for clear and concise directives and how-tos. Really, what we end up with is a lot of people who get super jazzed and inspired, if we're successful, that is. They don't just start yawning at our slideshows, right? If we're successful, they're really excited, and then they get on bar, and they're like, oh, I don't know how to make this drink. What do I do with skim milk in this beverage? Or there's mocha in an Americano and an espresso to go. Do we do espresso to go? I didn't think we did. Somebody said we did. Somebody said we didn't. There's so many practical decisions that baristas need to make on the bar every day. And the complexity of those decisions is multiplied by the number of different orders that come in. Even if, if you work the bar at the same cafe for years, you still have a generalized sense of anxiety about what's going to happen that day, even though you might know up to 50 or 75% of the orders coming in that day. I mean, it is just a menu, but the order in which those things happen and the randomized way it, it can go down, you really need to be super specific and structured because that's going to be the thing that people rely on in the midst of an unstructured environment like a day's rush or ordering and things like that. So instead of giving people theory or even worse, maybe giving them specifics about things that they just will never make, like uh, train people. And it would produce good milk. It would produce, you know, some knowledge about shots and things like that. Of course, nothing is purely a waste, but I used to train people by having them make up, you know, tons of traditional cappuccinos over and over and over again. I would drill people and I was half right if I want to be, you know, graceful to myself in that the drilling was, I think, useful. The completion of that idea, I think, is why don't we have people make the menu? Why are we not training people to make what they're going to make so that they get very, very good at drinks that are not our favorite drinks? You skim mochas and, you know, half-calf Americanos and all the in-betweens. And yeah, some of the other you know, things that maybe we would like, but often our bias toward what we want is what we end up training. And rather, we should be training people to make the menu. Now, you could do that as a trainer, but if you're not using some point of reference, then everything goes askew because it's he said, she said, I heard, it feels like this, I think that... Really, we need one unified standard, and that comes in the form of a manual where we teach people how we make any other derivation of a latte, whether it's flavored with syrup or sauce or powders or different mixes. There are lots of different ways that we assemble our menu, and what we find our hands doing on the bar needs to be guided by a definite standard or else we're going to leave it up to interpretation. And you know what happens is we end up coming to the conclusion that we've hired the wrong people because, yeah, you know, we put them through training and we taught them all about like specialty coffee and everything else. And they had all this experience, but they just don't seem to get it. But the problem is you say they don't get it. You never gave it to them. That's the problem. <laughs> if they don't get it, it's because you didn't give it to them. That's at least a question you should ask yourself. If you hear yourself asking the question, why don't they get it? Then you should ask yourself, did I give it to them? And so I think that having this standard, this document that says, look, here's how you make an espresso. Okay, so let's start by thinking about the basics. Espresso, milk, and coffee. These are the things we do, right? If you want to make this out to be just the bare bones barista training material, it is, here is coffee. Here is how we brew coffee at these coffee bars. You know, get to know the equipment that you're going to be using, get to know the coffee blends that you're going to be using. Here's the throw weights. Here's 
the resulting you know flavor profiles that we're shooting for. If you're crazy and specific, you want to talk about maybe some measurements of extraction and things like that. But you need to be specific about what things you're going to hold people accountable for accomplishing on the bar. So start with coffee. This is our coffee. Now, what about espresso? What is espresso? Talk about what espresso is. And you don't have to go into such great length that you end up with a book because this has to be a guide, but it also has to be a reference. So you can't have people just thumbing through a ton of material about, you know, the history of the ristretto shot and, you know, what the average Italian espresso bar did before modern advents of espresso and things like that. You just need to define the terms a little bit, and then you need to define the actions that you want people to do every day, hundreds of times a day. Here's the recipe. Yes, we start with a recipe for espresso. We say, here are the grams of coffee going in. Here's the grams of coffee going into the portafilter. Here is the weight that we want at the end, grams in terms of resulting liquid. Here's how long that should take. Here's the window that you have to dial into of time. And here is the taste profile, okay? So after you have all of that with the espresso, you need to tell people how to make it. You need to get so excruciatingly specific because the way that you describe these things in print and reference them and have people learn them is how they're going to imprint them into their muscle memory. They're going to do these things. They're going to internalize them. They're not going to go with their finger with reading glasses down on their end of their nose looking at each step every time they make a shot. They're going to memorize it the same way you do a closing list. And you, when you internalize specific things, you do specific things. If you want people to be detail-oriented, you have to orient them toward the details. In here, you have to say, here's how you make a shot of espresso. And you could get up to 15 to 20 steps specific of take the portafilter out of the espresso machine, wipe with the towel that is located in this area using two layers of the terry cloth so as to be able to get all of the corners of the basket dry without missing any water that could cause channeling. That's step one. See how detailed that was. Step two, place it, and you get the idea. And usually it takes us a couple of passes. If we're going to do this with a client, it takes a couple of passes of examination to say, okay, well, what if a barista assumes this? Well, the way you said that looks like I could easily just, you know, go, go around the corner and do something else. Now, I know as well as you do, like water, we want the path of least resistance. And so under pressure, hundreds of drinks in, we're going to falter to our training we don't raise ourselves to the level of our ideals, especially under duress. We fall to the level of our training. That's why you have to be specific here and make a how to make espresso very detailed, step-by-step, -step, predictive of what possibly could be somebody's thought. Of, you know, How could they misinterpret this? Write it in. What are some protests that their mind under duress during a rush could have? Be specific about it in this step-by-step -step process, okay? And by being specific, you then have a leg to stand on when you come back and say, oh, we don't tamp that way, or we don't want to hit that portafilter that many times, I mean, you know, with our hand to, to settle the pile, or, you know, any numbers of specific things. You say, that's not how we do it because we've trained how to do it. It's in the documents and we can bring ourselves to a standard over and over again. But if you don't have that detailed, then you're just trying to catch the wind. You're like Pecos Bill. I don't know. If, man, that's such an old reference right there. Pecos Bill. That was a cartoon. He tried to lasso a tornado. And so that is what it feels like, isn't it? Trying to lasso a tornado. Lasso? Lasso? <laughs> I don't know which one it is, actually. I don't use that term enough. Somebody from Texas, tell me. But if you try to do that to a tornado, guess what? You're not going to do it. Trying to get a hold of a shift where everyone is trying to survive the rush, but you don't really have a lot of specific trained standards, it's just as futile.
And now, of course, just like espresso, we go step by step. We say grab X pitcher, fill it up to a certain amount, purge the steam wand into the drip tray, being careful not to spray out, but holding the steam wand towel against it to form a curtain to prevent water from spraying onto the counter. Pull the steam wand out to a specific angle. By the way, if you really want to get specific here, I've done this both ways, where it's just text or pictorial. You can have pictures to represent what you're talking about. You can even have hyperlinks that go right to videos or embedded videos that show people doing the things that you want them to do. We have the technology, okay? We can do this. We just have to believe in the importance of it in order to do it. But we don't so much. I would go as far as to say, if you ever have complained about people not mopping correctly, this is exactly the how you should do your SOPs. If you want people to store the mop a certain way on the press of the mop bucket, you know, fanned out is my preference, you know, fanned out all beautifully and, you know, put in a certain angle and all that stuff. Show a photo. What does it look like? Or show a video of how do we achieve this? It's very quick. Now, already, I want to pause here and say, this sounds like a lot. It's funny because I'm saying be specific and be detailed, but you have to, in some sense, just jump into this and start building this training guide, this material. And don't think about it too much. When it comes to the decision to whether I'm going to do it or not do it, just do it. You know, or Shia LaBeouf and just do it, you know, just get it done Uh, because then you can create more specific versions in the future. If you didn't do it well the first time, at least you have it, you can adjust it. But if you don't have anything, you're going to keep relying on what you've always done, which is really hoping that the right people make up the difference for you. And that's never going to work. You have to have these tools. Now, I mentioned troubleshooting. Troubleshooting is absolutely necessary. What are the problems that you could come up with with espresso? Too fast, too slow, watery, sour, bitter, all those things. What do we do? How do you solve these problems? You have to include that in your guide. You also have to include things like alternative milks, plant-based beverages, and things like that with steaming. All right. So now you've got espresso, you've got milk, you've got your coffee, Here's how we brew coffee. And here's his steps to making a batch brew. Here are the steps to making something using the ground control brewer. Here's how to make a pour over. Here are the things that could go wrong with a pour over. Again, great detail with all of these things. Now, at the end of this, you want to have a section. How do we make the menu? Every drink on your menu has to have a specific way that it's created. So think of this as a recipe for people's actions, not necessarily a recipe of ingredients. So I see plenty of people who have recipes. Yes, we have a recipe, so many pumps, so many ounces. Great. But what about how to make it? Like there is a physical world in which we are executing that recipe. Every drink should have that kind of a Lord of the Rings depth of detail that will show you how to make a macchiato down to what side of the cup down to should the handle of the cup be facing the left or the right when you hand it to a customer and how do you hand it to a customer you know what are the things that people need to be aware of for americanos when they're making them are there things like don't put full cups of hot water on top of espresso machines for example Are there things like how much room you should leave for safety reasons? Or when somebody says leave room for cream, what does that even mean? You haven't defined these terms. Everyone's going to make up their own terms. And then we're going to have to chase the wind again. So be specific with this. Go down through every drink and just go espresso, macchiato, cortado, cappuccino, latte, mocha, specialty beverages, non-coffee, hot chocolates. It is worth it to be super specific because this is what people are going to you for. If you fully execute this, you might be one of the only places in your town doing it because it takes a lot of effort to do. But that is a key aspect of differentiation that you have invested so much in the foundation of your business, which is 
making a menu that you are trying to attract people into your coffee bar to purchase, saying to them, we will make this for you. And tomorrow when we make it for you, we'll do it the same way. That again, does not happen by accident. That happens using a guide. And this is something you'll always have and always adjust and make better and better. Okay. Now, Let's go into hospitality because hospitality is one part unique expression of your trusted team, assuming again that you've got the right people and they are people people. They're coffee lovers and they're people people. They love serving, all that stuff. There are still some borders. It's like bumper bowling. There, We need to help people out. Like We need to give some boundaries and some shape but still allow people to riff within that boundary, okay? Just like soloing on a guitar or even within jazz. There are places you can go that even sound discordant but work, but there's still boundaries. We're still using scales and modes and things like that. So in this context with hospitality, we have to have a few big picture guides for people to latch on to, and that will give them the material to use, the scales, the modes, the tuning, and all that stuff to work their magic. And it will be amazing to see what people do with the material you've given them to work with. And so and so the first thing I think you should do is map out the customer experience. That includes from the time they walk in, if you want to think about these things I'm going to say as number one, number two, number three, so these are categories or steps, right? So when they enter, now, when you're writing this guide, when they enter, I want you to create the expectations that you have of what they're experiencing and what your staff are doing and how they can accomplish that. If it means when somebody walks in that they don't see people leaning on the counter as though they are about to fall asleep, then that has to be outlined in the guide. So as a customer enters, this is what they're experiencing. This is what the staff are doing. We are alert and attentive and ready. We are all these things. Now there's not just that, it's what happens after that. The customer walks up to the counter. They are ordering. What does that look like, ordering? Well, what is their experience like? What are we saying to them? Are we giving them space? Are we finessing our body language so that we're not being too pushy or trying to herd them through the process or hurry them through the process? We have to be specific and address our default modes as well. We have to use these guides as a way to call out behaviors that sometimes we do when we think people don't see. The cop-outs that we do as baristas, as operators, as owners, as managers, everyone does it. If we pull it out into the light, it doesn't fester. And one of the first steps to do that is to put it in a guide and say, yes, we know that this is possible for us to, you know, be inattentive because we are kind of zoned into one area, but we have to have, for instance, peripheral awareness, right? So one customer enters. Now two, the customers at the POS, they're looking at the menu, they're interacting with you. How do you want your baristas to act? How do you want your managers to act? Detail that. Now, while the beverage is being made, what are they doing? They're seating themselves. They're finding a place to sit. How aware are we of them? If you want to listen to a great episode, go listen to Spiders is a shift break episode. I was trying to be cute <laughs> with that episode's title. It's all about like hospitality through the lens of what spiders do. And so that'd be an interesting one to, to read. But we want to be aware of them no matter where they are in the cafe. We hand their drink off to them. What are we doing? Where are we shoving it their way, calling out their drink in some loud, passive aggressive voice, and then turning and walking away and letting them just kind of like pick the drink up in solitude with no one there? Or are we making eye contact? Because we know where they are in the cafe. Are we showing, are we smiling? We're making eye contact when they we give them the drink. Are we saying, you know, a vanilla latte? And we confirm the drink. Do we hand it to them with intention? I do things in the cafe when I'm working the bar, even to the point where if I give somebody a croissant in a bag, I pat the bag with my hand as if to say, I have, you know, intentionally given you this bag. I am, I am christening this bag yours. So I don't know. There's just little things you can do 
to make things intentional, that makes a big difference. That's part of hospitality, right? So what does that look like? Now they're during their stay, you know, the, while they're seating, you might go out and you might have a time to bust tables. What does that look like to interact with guests out there? How ready should your baristas be to get questions asked to them? And then when the customer gets ready to leave, what are we doing? Are we saying goodbye? How are we saying that? What do we want their experience to be like? So if you've mapped out that experience, then you're ahead of the curve. And by the way, one of the last things that I like to talk about is what should we be doing when the customer is gone? Are we anxiously running back into the three bay area or the barista closet to just talk some crap about them? Because we can be so petty. Somebody as a customer may not be your cup of tea, right? But that doesn't mean that they deserve to have vitriol thrown their way. Not everybody who you personally don't really like that much is problematic. And oftentimes baristas get into this mob mentality almost where we start just dishing on customers. And guess what happens? We create that caricature of a customer. We've talked about this on the show before. And the next time they come in, go back up to step one. Your ability to greet them well and welcome them into the space goes way down because now you've got this picture of them in your mind, born from all of this gossip that you've done and, you know, blowing assumptions out of you know proportion. And it's harder to serve people right? So resist the pettiness, but in the guide, call it out and say, this is what we do. We don't talk ill of the customer behind their back in group settings while you're at work, you know, because that absolutely, that toxic practice will impact hospitality and the success of the business. And that's not really good for anybody. Now on hospitality and having a guide for this, so we've already been very specific about the customer's experience, but we have to guide people's actions and intentions in something that is more of a like secondary form of values. Like you might have company values, but what about the things that guide how you behave behind the bar related to hospitality? Could be urgency, communication, could be quality, attention to detail, it could be that you are a guide yourself. Like that is a value that you have. Like embody the idea that you are a guide and not a gatekeeper. And detail, what does it mean to show urgency behind the bar? What does it mean to have awareness behind the bar? How do we show hospitality to each other? If I just say, well, I was assigned to be on the POS and everyone else can just, you know, whatever they, I don't care. This is my role. Yeah. And I'm just going to keep my head down, do my work. And that's it. Now, if we're not exercising hospitality one to another in helping out each other, we're not going to get through this shift. And you probably do need to detail what the tertiary responsibilities are of that role. So if you say POS, you do X, Y, and Z, these are your primary roles. What happens when you don't have customers and everything is stocked? Here now you are going to do this. And again, these are big picture guides for behaviors that you hope your great baristas will then take and riff on. And they will do more than, I'm not saying about doing more work like, I'm saying doing work in a way that is intuitive to the moment. That is what I mean by doing more than you could think. Not more load of work, but more work within the expected parameters that is different in approach than maybe you had thought about, but is not against the values that you've put forth. And that makes you better. They get to explore all of the the nooks and crannies and the ideas of how your business can be expressed. And you can let that proliferate when you have these types of guides set up. Okay. You have better peace of mind. Or if somebody does something that's against the values, then you can say, Hey, we have this value of urgency, but there's been this thing where everyone has to kind of pull up the slack for you on the bar and you're very slow to greet customers. Okay. So we know there's this value of urgency in our hospitality guide. So how do we solve this problem together? How can you and I 
as a manager and a barista work together to really help the urgency. And sometimes you can do that. And sometimes people will not be able to, but again, it gives you some place to go back to the beginning of this conversation. We can talk about coffee, how we make coffee. We can talk about hospitality and how we treat people, how we treat each other. And all of it has to be based on a specific standard. Okay. That's what these guides are meant to do. So go through and with your hospitality guide, you just kind of say, here are the values of what hospitality, here are the actions that we have in hospitality. Like I said, it could be urgency, it could be intentionality, it could be, you know, peripheral awareness in any other thing. I would love to see like lots of detail about what does it mean? What does it mean to do that stuff? Don't pat yourself on the back quite yet if you've created a great outline for this, where you've got those kind of hospitality values and character traits. Now you have to detail what does that look like on your bar? And it may be different for each store too, by the way, because if you're going to be specific about how somebody practices urgency in a bar that's large, that might look different than a bar that's small. So being able to get to the POS in a small bar is not nearly the kind of task it is at a much larger bar. Your guide has to take that into account. So all of this is to say, and I think you can guess that if you're going to write anything as a standard for your business, you could probably follow the same principles. Having a guide specifically for hospitality and making your menu is probably one of the most important things that you can do for your coffee shop success, for your barista's success, and for your customers successfully enjoying your shop. And so I've seen great fruit from these efforts. My clients, as they put this into practice, have seen this just change the way people approach their work and the drinks get better. Service gets better. It's just amazing. So I hope that this was helpful for you today, and I would love to hear what you have to say about it. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, just send them to me, chris at keystotheshop.com. That's also where you can reach out if you are interested in working with Keys to the Shop Consulting, or you are also wanting to know a little bit about this keyholder coaching group that's coming up in September. And I would love to give you more information, have a conversation about that as well. If you'd like to participate and sign on for that as one of the uh, five of this initial group. So again, the email is chris at keys to the shop.com. And I'm really excited because very shortly, Coffee Fest is happening. I'll be in Southern California. I'll be visiting a client out there and then I will be rolling right into Coffee Fest Anaheim. And that is going on from the 6th through the 8th. And I will be giving a couple of presentations there, judging latte art. And if you don't know what Coffee Fest is, it is a 30-year-old trade show and education and resource center has been equipping coffee shop owners and operators with the tools for success for those three decades by offering amazing lectures, trainings, and workshops, panel discussions, as well as an awesome community and competitions and the trade show floor, of course, where you can interact with amazing, where you can interact with some great vendors to outfit your shop with products and services and ingredients and that kind of thing. So go visit them over at coffeefest.com. If you're interested in going to Anaheim or to Orlando coming up in November this year, use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S, to get 50% off your registration uh, when you sign yourself and your team up over at coffeefest.com. Again, that's KEYS, K-E-Y-S, gets you 50% off general admission for Coffee Fest. And I hope to see you there at Coffee Fest. So with that, that is the end of our show today, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with me and listen to me talk about hospitality and drink guides. And more than anything, I hope that you take the first step after this to start making those a reality in your coffee bar. Yeah, don't forget to subscribe to Keys to the Shop. Share the episodes with your friends, with your team, with your followers. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.